Jonathan, welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm very glad that you are here and um, we'd like to discuss a little bit about the industry itself, but also about your company. Because as you know, Mitsubishi Electric has quite a big network of partners, but I would say that um, Robovision is quite a special partner. So could you introduce your, yourself and your company to our uh, customers and audience? I'm uh, Jonathan Berti. I'm the founder of Robovision. And Robovision is an AI platform company. And indeed, in the industry and quality control, uh, that's something like a new thing um, because we enable our customers, the end customers, so the customers of your customers, to uh, train their own AI models. And we were truly pioneering in this. Uh, we started out uh, more than 10 years ago in horticulture uh, to pick plants. Uh, and we extended into manufacturing and also in retail uh, because, yeah, frankly speaking, our customers really love to be in control, not to have a lock-in and to really extend the product lines. If there is a new variation of a product to easily teach it in with a normal line operator. That's more or less the essence of what we do. Okay. So, um, because we are here on the Interpark and I have seen a lot of um, like companies that are uh, doing some, you know, vision recognition, vision inspection. So maybe you could uh, explain what is your, let's say, key advantage. How yes. do you address the market needs? Well, the industry for the last, let's say, three to four decades has always been um, in integrator uh, focused, meaning that the integrator takes the responsibility, the full responsibility of uh, the solution towards an end customer. But in some markets, uh, this is very challenging because for instance if you're a family company and you also rely on automation but if you need to teach yeah if you need to handle different kind of flowers uh, on a daily basis like a new flower type every day you have no budget to call an integrator because it's just too expensive and the integrator would also not like to have such a high degree of dependency that's why we chose more than six years ago to go for a line operator first approach. Uh, it's a very intuitive user interface where you can just um, teach the system what is a bad product or teach the system what your orientation must be. And you don't need to be technical at all. And you can also manage the AI lifecycle, which is something truly unique because the AI lifecycle is something that will really pop up more and more because of the high degree of flexibility in the production uh, ecosystem. So if there is, for instance, a slight modification, for instance, you have a new kind of branding on your packaging, you have a new type of publicity or marketing, you don't want to go to your integrator because your marketing department decides to put some other kind of um, text on your uh, Rittersport uh, packaging. And then that's why we enable the line operator at the line just five minutes before production to teach that in himself in a way that is operator focused, operator first. So basically in other words, um, you like put all this know-how inside of your machine so that at the end, the operator only simply teaches the new product, for example. Yes, and it can be a really complicated product. Like we're absolutely specialized in 3D, for instance. Uh, we've even supported machine builders to automatically plant tulips. Um, and this is very, very challenging. How do you use Mitsubishi Electric products? How do they bring value to the types of applications you're making? What we see, and I've visited Japan several times, uh, and also Mitsubishi plants, is that there, are, there is a high degree of empathy with the uh, final use cases. Uh, so Mitsubishi, for instance, was really well aware where the cobalt would be used, uh, for instance, in food and beverage, and what type of uh, requirements are very important there. So what I see with Mitsubishi, in contrast with other suppliers, is that they have a very good feedback loop to their product engineers and to the strategy of what is really the USP on a new product line. For instance, the, uh, the fact that a cobalt can be installed on a mobile platform and can be like a flexible worker is truly unique in the industry. And I expect a lot of uh, sales from that. So I, I see the market still is, is early for that, but it's, it's certainly something that will be needed um, with a lot of reshoring happening right now. So 
basically your technology uh, allows companies to be very flexible in their production. Yeah. And then you expect something similar from the automation equipment that will be executing the process. Right? Absolutely, absolutely. What, what you have is that you, you have machines that need to generate more and more return on investments. But those machines become often more simple in the sense that a robot is extremely flexible, but needs the software to become, to, to, to live up to its flexibility promises. Yeah. All right. Um, so during those conversations, I try also to try to look into the future. So could you also share your thoughts on uh, what kind of trends do you see emerging and how the future of manufacturing will look like? Well, the future of manufacturing will in any case uh, evolve towards even more automation and more flexibility. Um, yeah, personalized uh, packaging. Uh, we've all seen the Coca-Cola cans where you can just uh, print your own picture. Uh, but it all needs to be quality control. People forget that uh, manufacturing is all about uh, this very narrow bandwidth of keeping up to the spec. Uh, and, and several markets, for instance, the Japanese market, consumer market is extremely harsh on perfect packaging. So you need perfect quality control to live up to this promise. Yeah. Right, Jonathan, that was a pleasure. Thank no. you very much. Thank you so much. Hope to talk to you more. Yeah, thank you.